Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Hudson Memorial Lecture at the Department of Earthquake Engineering, IIT Roorkee. So before proceeding, I would like to share a very short and but a sweet story with you. So it was year 2014 when I attended my first scientific conference. I was quite new, but and most of the displays and the talks in that conference were beyond my grip and understanding. However, I met a professor who very kindly explained me his poster and his research work. His work was on shear transformation zone. He spent a lot of time with me and ensured that I, I understand strain localization, pulse strength evolution, energy partitioning during earthquakes, ruptures, and many other complicated mathematics and, uh, and physics behind those. I really felt that my first scientific conference was successful then. Today, I'm very happy to meet him again this evening, Professor Ak Ahmed Ettaf Elbenna from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. We are all here to know more about earthquakes, fault zones, mechanics, computation, experiments, granular materials, shear zones, complex systems. And along all these sciences, we will feel how kindness and science can go together. So please join me to welcome once again, Professor Ahmed Ettaf Elbenna, our speaker for Hudson Memorial Lecture 2021. I now request Professor Pankaj Agarwal, Head of Earthquake Engineering Department, IIT Roorkee, to please say a few words regarding our department and the legacy that brought the Hudson Memorial Lecture Series in being. Thanks. So, um, Professor Urbano, Professor Chaturvedi, Dr. IIT Roorkee, and the learned audience, a very good evening to you all. Let me introduce briefly the exciting history of the Department of Earthquake Engineering, IIT Roorkee. Our department, earlier known as the School for Research and Training in Earthquake Engineering at the University of Roorkee. This school was a vision of Professor A. N. Bosla, then Vice Chancellor of the University of Roorkee. The school was made possible by the continuous persuasion and help of Professor G. W. Hausner, President of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, California, and crucial contribution of Professor Donald Hudson from Caltech. Consequently, Professor Jack Ishana from the Department of Civil Engineering, University of Roorkee, visited Caltech during 1956-57 to learn more about earthquake engineering with Professor Hudson and Hausen. Both visited University of Roorkee in 1958 and introduced the postgraduate course in structural dynamics. They also helped in organizing the first symposium of earthquake engineering in 1959. This symposium prepared the basis for establishing the School for Research and Training in Earthquake Engineering. Professor Jack Ishna was the first director. Subsequently, in 1971, the school emerged as the Department of Earthquake Engineering with Professor A.S. Arya as its first head. Our department cherished a glorious past with milestone of achievement. I mentioned a few of them here, like a strong promotion program, 1967, development of Indian Standard Code of Practice, 1968, establishment of Seismological Observatory in 1977, Indian National Strong Motion Instrumentation Network, 1976, organization of Sixth World Conference on Earthquake Engineering at New Delhi in 1977, Telemetrated Seismic Network of Instrumentation in Ganga Yumna Valley in 1986, First computer control shake table 1986, cyclic test facility in 1995, nationwide strong motion instrumentation program in Himalayan region 2004, and integrating large scale zero dynamic test facility 2018. In 2018, the Department of Earthquake Engineering started an annual lecture to honor 
the crucial contribution of Professor Donald Hudson. Professor M. D. Tufnet from the University of Southern California delivered the inaugural lecture of the Hudson Lecture Series. Today, we are hosting the second lecture of this series through online mode, and it's our great pleasure to have with us Professor Albana from the University of Illinois, Urbana Champion, to deliver the lecture on modeling earthquake rapture with high resolution called drone PDS. Thank you very much. Yes, I think uh, we are continuing the Caltech legacy here as well. Professor Ahmed uh, Elbinna holds a PhD in civil engineering from uh, Caltech. And he also holds a, a, a master's degree from uh, on applied mechanics also from Caltech. And he also have another master's degree in structural engineering from his uh, from Cairo University and bachelor's as well there, from there. He's currently an associate professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where he leads the mechanics of complex systems laboratory. It's complicated stuff, really. Uh, professor Albana's uh, research includes uh, problems in theoretical and applied mechanics of solids, and he emphasizes on fractures, fluids, deformation, wave propagation, uh, and many more related to fault zone that I that, that we yet, yet to see problems they arise in geophysics, soft materials, material design, fault zones, and many other applications. He is a Donald Bigger Willett uh, faculty fellow at Granger College of Engineering, a fellow of National Center of Supercomputing Application, a faculty affiliate of Beckman Institute of Advanced Studies and a recipient of National Science uh, Foundation's uh, Faculty Early Career Award. And there are his signs and his group is quite well, is, is well recognized among us. And I now request Professor Ahmed el to please uh, share your uh, slides. And, uh, uh, and we are at the point where we would like to know more about earthquakes. And thank you participants again, but we'd request that please uh, post your questions on the in the comment box and we'll take at the end with me. I have Professor Ritesh Kumar who will handle this. And yeah, so please post your questions in the chat box. Professor Ahmed Elbanna, the floor or the screen is all yours now. Thank, thanks so much, uh, Sohom and Professor Agrawal for, for this introduction. Uh, Soham, it, it has always been a pleasure to know you, somebody who is a rising star and whose work is rigorous and thoughtful. And I always enjoyed the discussions we had in person and remotely as well. And it's so delightful to hear about this history of earthquake engineering department at Ruruki. As I mentioned, it's it's it is there is there aren't as many places where earthquake science and engineering blend, but it seems like this is one of these places, um, unique places across the world. And it's heartening to hear, to hear about this connection to Caltech as a Caltech alumni and also as a recipient of, of a George Hausner Fellowship. This is how I got to Caltech in the first place. So I, I'm really glad to learn about this connection between IIT and Professor Hausner and Professor and, and Professor um, and, and Caltech. So this is this is this is wonderful. So so today I I will speak about um, a line of research that um, my group has been interested uh, in uh, for the last few years, and and the objective is to study the problem of earthquake source. Uh, with high resolution to uncover the physics of this complex phenomena. And, and I will mention in a few slides why we are actually interested in modeling uh, this complex phenomena, although we may have observations correct, collected through seismograms and so on. Uh, first, but first, before that, I would like to acknowledge the students and the group members who have contributed and are contributing to this 
effort, uh, starting from Dr. Hajar Azwadi, who graduated and is now at Facebook, Dr. Shauma, who is now at ExxonMobil, and then Mohammed Abdel Megid and Matt Shamon Maya, who are currently uh, PhD students in, in my group, as well as my collaborators, uh, Gabriel Albertini and David Kamer at ETH. So, since IIT Ruki has this amazing blend of engineering, uh, of earthquake engineering and science, I thought I would introduce this slide first that you are all familiar with, which I also use in my earthquake engineering class just to emphasize the multi scale, multi interdisciplinary nature of the earthquake problem. So, as a structure engineers, we are interested in uh, analyzing uh, the structure response under dynamic excitations from the earthquakes. And these dynamic excitations are uh, inferred from the ground motions that uh, geotechnical engineers would be studying in terms of attenuation and amplification in the shallow layer of the crust, maybe from 100 meter to one kilometer studying how these uh, ground motions are, are um, uh, advected and attenuated and amplified. But the origin of these ground motions, of course, are waves that are emitted from the sudden motion or sudden slip on a fault plane embedded deep in the crust. So 7 to 10 kilometer deep, there would be um, a sudden motion, slip motion that happens on a fault surface, and this is dynamic enough to generate waves that propagate through, through the layers of the crust. And this is what seismologists would spend their lives studying, how these waves are generated and what happens as they propagate through the different layers in terms of transmission, reflection, refraction, and so on. And, and the origin of the wave, this, this particular mechanism of fault slip on a frictional surface is what physicists and mechanists are interested in. We would like to formulate uh, well-posed problems to understand what controls this sudden motion, what makes it stop, and how it could evolve in space and time. So as you can see, there's, there's of course a range of scales from kilometers to perhaps meters and submeters when it comes to the uh, earth to the structural design, and then there are multiple disciplines from physics, mechanics, seismology, geotechnical engineering, and structural engineering. So if if I just go back to why we would use mechanics or or be interested in in studying earthquakes from a mechanics perspective, there there are two motivations in my perspective. One is a scientific motivation because actually earthquake represents a unique laboratory for studying fractures on extreme scales. Usually in engineering applications, we like to avoid fracture. We design um, against collapse. We don't want our structures to break. However, earthquakes is all about the fracture process itself. It's all about what happens during the fracture process and hence this is an, a, a unique opportunity for people interested in fracture mechanics. But from a societal perspective, unfortunately, there isn't enough data so far to infer what happens in large earthquakes. So this is a map from USGS that summarizes the mag larger than magnitude six earthquakes that happened between 1900 and 2017. And you can count at most perhaps five to six um, earthquakes of magnitude greater than nine, maybe 50 of magnitude greater than eight, and 500 of magnitude greater than seven. So we don't have enough data to infer uh, reliable uh, statistical patterns. And this is why we need simulations to fill in this gap and uh, uh, give us scenarios to what expect, say, about a magnitude eight uh, on, on San Andreas or a magnitude nine that happens on a subduction zone. But there is no free lunch. Like if, if these simulations were easy, we would have accomplished it uh, by now. But the problem is earthquakes exhibit uh, a, a remarkable multi-scale spatial temporal complexity. And 
And by this, um, I mean, especially when I look at when we look at how the earthquake develop and propagate, they are especially scales from microns related to how the grains and fault zone rearrange in order to give the resistance or weakening to the slip motion to kilometers, which is the uh, the, the average size of, of an earthquake, it will span uh, several uh, kilometers across the fault surface. And temporary also, the, the range of time scales of interest range from maybe seconds, and that is what a typical earthquake would uh, occur through the duration of a typical earthquake, to maybe tens or hundred years, and this is the inter-event time between earthquakes, where the crust is being loaded and the energy is built up in order to make conditions correct for the next earthquake. So, in fact, we can uh, identify 10 to 14 spatial and temporary scales of relevance to this problem. It's, it's, it's something on the same scale as when, we, when, when people study cosmology or, or, or general relativity. So, it's, it's really a humongous problem that we cannot, at the moment, cover all aspects um, for it. And, and this is, as in many other uh, spatiotemporal uh, uh, complex problems, this, prov this introduces a challenge for our numerical schemes and computational methods. Of course, there are also challenges for observations and laboratory experiments, but, but I will uh, just focus today on, on the numerical aspects. However, there is a special class of problems that arise when we look deeper into uh, fault zones and earthquakes. And this class of problems um, are characterized by complexity that is relatively local. So while fault zones uh, uh, have geometric or material complexities, the most relevant ones to controlling the rupture propagation tend to be relatively local. And by relatively local, I mean they extend in the direction normal to the fault surface to distances that are small compared to the fault length. So here are a couple of examples. In, in panel A, this is an idealization of a fault damage zone where you have a complex fault surface surrounded by a medium of variable degree of damage. And when people measure how far this damage zone extends relative to the fault surface, they find that in the transverse direction, that could be uh, just 1 to 10% of the length of the fault. Similarly, when uh, people started doing numerical simulations with co-seismic plasticity or damage uh, that is generated during the dynamic rupture, they observe that this damage extends to a narrow region surrounding the fault surface. So this, uh, this relative locality is interesting. It's it's in a sweet spot between something that is too narrow to be, uh, uh, that can be lumped on the fault surface. So if this damage zone was very small in width, we could have homogenized it and put it as an additional friction low on the fault surface, but it's not. It's also not very diffuse that it fills up the space around the fault. So it's in between these two uh, limits. And this is what inspired us to uh, develop this. Oops, sorry. Uh, do, do you see my slide now? Uh, yes, uh, we can see the slide. We are still on okay, slide great. number five. Yeah, now. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, so this, this kind of, of relative locality inspired us to think about the following numerical scheme. So imagine you have a, a fault zone that is uh, like a fault surface that's surrounded by some heterogeneity or complexity in terms of branching and so on. Instead of using a purely a volumetric based method in which you discretize the whole domain uh, surrounding the fault and then impose absorbing boundary conditions far enough in order to make sure that the waves generated by the dynamic phenomena will not reflect it back and spoil the dynamic process, but can be uh, taken away from the 
domain of interest, instead of using this approach, we can think of a domain decomposition approach or for those who are in, in, in geotechnical engineering and earthquake engineering, this is like a substructuring technique where we focus mainly on the regions surrounding the fault where the nonlinearity and, and material heterogeneity exist, and we surround it with a computational box, which we call a virtual strip. And, and this computational box here is narrow enough to contain all the sources of complexity and heterogeneity in the fault zone, and we can apply our favorite domain, like uh, volume-based discretization method to this uh, region, finite difference, finite element, discontinuous galeric, and whatever you like. But then the rest of the domain cannot just be ignored because the rest of the domain is where the waves will be propagating and where is the strain energy reservoir that feeds into the crack comes. So along the edges of this computational box, we define a boundary integral relationship to represent the exterior upper and lower half spaces. And, and the algorithm will, will just go like this. You solve one step within the uh, virtual strip, you couple the displacement and traction on the virtual boundary, and then you use the boundary integral equations to solve uh, for the traction and displacement on that virtual boundary. And through this coupling between the, uh, in the interior strip and the exterior half spaces, iteratively you can converge to a solution and you can advance uh, with a much lower computational cost because you only need to discretize a much narrower region than the full, the full domain. One advantage of our coupling technique is that we solve the boundary integral in the Fourier domain and that makes it computationally efficient and also highly accurate. And, and if, if you are interested in learning more about this method, he, here are a couple of, of references uh, that, that you can check. And we have extensively verified and validated, verified this, this modeling approach and showed that it's, it's relatively, it's, it's highly accurate and, and stable. So he, here are a few uh, references. Uh, if if you would like to explore uh, more about this method, so um, with with this technique where you can zoom in the fault zone and put a lot of uh, computational resources or high resolution into this, we would like to to test whether this is uh, worth it or not. Like, is it worth to study fault zones with high resolution? Would you, we learn something new that? we may not be able to discover if we just use a, a coarser approach or a coarser mesh or neglect some small scale details in the fault zone. So we want to ask this question, does small scale physics matter? And how small is small? And if they matter, do we need to worry about their implications? So here's, I will show an example that we published a couple of of years ago, and it it's basically consists of a, of a fault plane uh, in a domain that's subjected to tectonic far field tectonic loading, normal and shear stress, and this fault is having small branches attached to it. So there are an echelon of cracks, short cracks, that emanate from the main fault, and, and, and this the situation usually appears and has been observed in experiments as well as in the field too. When, when you have more two fracture on a surface, it uh, eventually starts to generate uh, brittle localized damage in a form of an echelon of fractures, um, usually on the tension side of, of, of the rupture. Um, so we, we consider this planar fault in, in a linear elastic medium under plane strain conditions. And these secondary branches, we insist on modeling them explicitly, although they are short, which, and I will define short relative to a, some characteristic length scale R here that relates frictional properties to elastic properties in the medium, and we call it an elastofrictional length scale. So our the branches that we simulate here are short, meaning the length is comparable to this R. So they would usually 
carry only a very small amount of slip and uh, they might actually be neglected in, 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 in regular analysis because they are too small to carry any appreciable uh, moment or, or, or slip in the earthquake budget. But we will hopefully see that their effect on the rupture on the main fault could be significant. And if that is the case, then they cannot be safely ignored. And of course, when we have these kinds of problems, we, may, we want to make sure that uh, we project the far field tectonic stresses properly on the different slip planes so that we have the correct shear normal stress on each surface. So, so what happens when we run a rupture through this, uh, this uh, uh, fish bone like uh, fault network? One thing we realize is that we start having significant uh, normal stress and shear stress heterogeneities left behind the rupture. So if you don't have these branches, the, the stresses drop to the dynamic friction and the overall stress state would be homogeneous as seen by the black line here. But because of these branches uh, start to slip as they interact with the rupture tip, they generate kind of dipoles on, on, the, on the main fault plane and this stress heterogeneity might be relevant for later uh, earthquake nucleation and propagation in subsequent cycles, or could also affect, as we will show, how the radiated energy and the shaking from the earthquake is, uh, in, is uh, generated. So here is uh, two snapshots of the imagining that we can look from space and measure how the particle velocity uh, around the fault is changing as the rupture is propagating. So this is, these are contours for the particle velocity. The bottom one is for the homogeneous medium where you don't have these branches. And, and you can see that the overall, the medium has kind of a homogeneous wave field and the intense particle velocity and high frequency is more concentrated near the rupture tips. Whereas at the top panel here, this is when you account for the existence of these branches and you model propagation of the rupture in the main fault while these branches exist, you start seeing these interesting fringes that are propagating away from the rupture tip. These are signature of coherent interferences between the slip on the small branches. So each branch, although it slips a little bit, but it represents a source of waves. And as the branches get excited one by one, you, they, the waves emanating from these different branches start to uh, constructively interfere and generate this high frequency uh, motion that actually gets advected away from the fall. So it's no longer only concentrated near the rupture tip. And that has implications for earthquake engineering. For example, if I look at the acceleration spectral amplitude, so I, I imagine having a seismogram somewhere away from the fault and start measuring the acceleration and then take the Fourier spectrum of that acceleration, we find that with the wave fish bone, we get a much larger content of high frequencies. And there is um, a kind of a flat spectrum between one hertz and 20 hertz. And this is the frequency range that is most relevant to our structures because our structures would have a frequency like a 10 story building would have a natural period of around one, one, one second, right? So uh, between one and 20 hertz, this is the frequency that is most relevant to the shaking of our intermediate uh, and, and, high, and, and like short intermediate and relatively high rise uh, building. So uh, compared to the regular uh, fall off that we would observe uh, in a rupture propagating in a homogeneous medium, the accounting for these short branches and off fault uh, geometric complexities seems to enhance the high frequency content and, and lead to observations that are also compatible with the seismic observations related to this flat spectrum in, in, in this frequency band. And, and, and this is not the whole story. In fact, 
we, we have also shown that the qualitative nature of the rupture on the main fault might be affected by what's happening on these branches. So again, I emphasize these are small, short branches. So we may be tempted to neglect them, but the feedback on the rupture process is significant. So here's an example of, uh, uh, of what I just mentioned. So I will look at the particle velocity and you would see that on the left side, on the right side, there, there's these weird intense planes that they start to emanate from the rupture tip. We call this Mahcones, and these are similar. This happens when the rupture tip exceeds the shear wave speed. This is similar to an airplane that's propagate, that is flying in the air at a speed that is exceeding the speed of sound. So they produce a sonic boom and Mahcone in earthquakes. Something like that happens too if the rupture tip exceeds the shear wave speed in the rock. You, you get a coalescence or a collapse of the shear wave front along a, 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 a almost planar surface. And these are called Mach fronts, which carry intense ground motion to far away distances and can cause severe damage to structures. So although the branches are short, but if they are oriented correct enough, they actually feed back energy into the rupture tip and make a make force the rupture to, to propagate even faster and transition to a super shear uh, propagation. On the other hand, where the rupture tip is propagating in a homogeneous medium and there are no branches, the rupture just continue to propagate as a sub Rayleigh rupture and the intense motion again is, is just concentrated near the rupture tip. So there are not only theoretical implications for uh, fault zone complexity, but there are practical implications in terms of high frequency ground motion, as well as um, uh, super shear transition and Mach cone generations, which might have implications for uh, for for uh, also uh, shaking of our structures. So these previous results, when we got them, they are. They were pretty exciting to us, but we had to ask the question whether they are robust. And, and the answer is at that time, we don't know yet because all the simulations I have shown you are by design. Like I assume the initial conditions, I put in the system geometry and I run one realization of earthquakes. They are still interesting because if these conditions are realizable, then we know what to expect. But in reality, we actually need to probe the long time response. And, and, and the reason is we don't really know what the initial conditions in the crust are. Uh, uh, the, the earth has been active for, for, for millions of years, and these fault systems have been slipping over multiple earthquake cycles. And through this history of slip and healing and slip and healing, damaging and healing, etc. Uh, the stress state and the geometry evolve. So we, we need to uh, devise a, a numerical scheme that can track this long-term response. And, and this is when we pushed our um, hybrid finite element spectral boundary integral a little bit more. So the, 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 the approach that we took is a bit-by-bit -bit approach. What I showed you was a dynamic rupture modeling and wave propagation formulation. So we, we had an explicit non-adaptive in time scheme where we couple this finite element with the spectral boundary integral. But the next step was to develop a hybrid scheme for the interseismic period. Once the earthquake is over, things become quiet and you start getting creep and aseismic deformation uh, in the crust. There is no, The inertia effects are not important during that period and what you basically are looking for is a series of static problems that are subjected to time dependent loading from the far field tectonics. So we also develop a quasi a dynamic algorithm where we use adaptive time stepping in order to uh, cross tens or hundreds of years uh, efficiently. And we developed a solver because now, since you are solving a static problem, it's kind of an elliptic problem. You have to solve this implicitly and invert 
the, the, the linearized system of equations. So we developed this approach as well. So now we have two pieces of the puzzle. We have an algorithm to develop the dynamic rupture and wave propagation. And we have a, also an algorithm to simulate long-term evolution of slip during a seismic creep and quasi-dynamic deformation. Now we can combine these two by introducing a proper uh, switching criteria. So if, for example, the slip rate on the fault becomes high enough, we should switch from a quasi-dynamic to a dynamic formulation and incorporate inertia. Once the slip rate drops to a low value, uh, we can uh, safely assume that inertia effects are not important and we switch back to the quasi-dynamic with adaptive time step approach. And as usual, we start with the 2D anti-plane problem, the mode three rupture, because it's the simplest problem we could model. And then we go to 2D in-plane and eventually 3D. And I will show you today some example of modeling these earthquake cycles in the anti-plane setting, but we also have it completed for the in-plane and we are currently working on, on the 3D component. So just as a reminder, an anti-plane problem uh, occurs in mode three fracture. It's similar to tearing a sheet of paper. So what happens here, this is a schematic. You have um, a crack and this crack is propagating along this, these thick blue lines. So the, it's propagating in the plane of the screen, but the crack itself is being driven by forces that are normal to the plane of the screen. So the slip on the crack surface is inward or outward of the screen, whereas the direction of propagation itself is along the screen. And again, it's like to tear a sheet of paper. So you would see that the tear is propagating along the sheet direction, but uh, what you are, that you, your tearing motion is out and into the plane of, of the sheet. And I will show you something that uh, is very recent and, and, and we are pretty excited about because it incorporates not only evolution of seismic and aseismic slip on the fault surface, but it also couples it with the evolution of the rheology in the bulk. So we, I will show examples of earthquake cycles with off-fault plasticity. And the setting we are studying here is a planar fault that has a, a central region characterized by velocity weakening friction, which means that this friction in steady state, uh, the frictional strength decreases if the fault uh, slips faster. And that's a hallmark for instability because it means if you slip faster, the frictional resistance goes down. So you even slip even faster. So this is a recipe for instability here. But this uh, central fault velocity weakening region is uh, surrounded by two creeping velocity strengthening regions. And by velocity strengthening, we mean that the frictional strength increases with the slip rate. So as you slip faster, it's like a viscous fluid, the resistance actually grows more, which means that you try to quench that slip and erase the rupture. And then the fault itself is loaded on the edges by um, a prescribed plate loading rate. And I will not go into the details of the parameters. They might not be interested. Interesting, the, the important point in the bulk itself, we have um, a plastic rheology, an elastoplastic rheology. So how do we formulate this problem? We formulate this problem by uh, incorporating the momentum balance and provide the constitutive equations where the stress rate is proportional to the uh, to the elastic strain rate. And then there's a kinematic relation, of course, connecting the strain to displacement gradient. We introduced a yield function in the anti-plane uh, problem. Von Mises and Drucker Prager are, are, are equivalent, actually. So we introduced just a classical a yield surface um, and uh, without hardening, and we introduce a flow a flow rule, an associative flow rule. The the main thing we added here is we use a return mapping with a viscoplastic 
regularization and, and the motivation is to introduce a time scale which uh, we can resolve so that our solution is well posed and 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 uh, the the this this viscous regularization is just the simplest uh, technique that we can use to ensure the well posedness of of our our problem and the main idea is when the stresses exceed the yield stress then or go above the yield surface then this excess stress is being carried by a viscous damper and and the stresses are relaxed over a time scale that's given by the ratio of the viscosity to the shear modulus so what happens when we start running uh, these simulations so let me first contrast the elastic case versus the a case with viscosity and these uh, figures might be a little bit complicated so i will try to explain it and i would be happy to take any questions after after the the seminar but uh, on the horizontal axis here this is the spatial dimension so this is the position along the fold and on the vertical axis we we record the value of the slip on the fault. So at, at a given time, how much slip has been accumulated on the fault. And the blue lines are being drawn every three months during the aseismic deformation, whereas the red or magenta lines are plotted every 10 microsecond during co-seismic deformation. So the way we read this is, for example, here, we have a nucleation of, let me see if I can, um, I have a laser pointer here. You have nucleation of the rupture here. Uh, first of all, there's preceding a seismic creep that everything is slipping in the velocity strengthening region and accumulating slip is seismically. It penetrates through the velocity weakening and putting, and eventually a seismic event is nucleated and slip is being accumulated here until the seismic event is over. And then you have another episode of uh, a seismic slip followed by another seismic event, and this uh, repeats periodically, as you can see here. So, in the elastic case for the same frictional parameters, you get a kind of a periodic motion. When we start simulating this same problem, but with off fault plasticity, you still get a periodic motion. But then you start seeing this kind of a dipping, of a dip here. You have a dip in the slip, which doesn't exist in the uh, elastic case. And the dip in this in the slip is called a slip deficit. And, and this slip deficit occurs because instead of having all the slip localized on the surface, you actually now is damaging the bulk and generating inelastic strain in the bulk. So some slip is now occurring as a diffusive deformation in the bulk. So there's some slip partitioning between the fault surface and the bulk itself. So this is what I highlight here as, as evidence for slip deficit. And we can also look at the equivalent plastic strain uh, away like in the bulk uh, outside the fault surface and we can see it accumulates from one event to another, it increases and extends away from the surface. And these are observations that are similar to what's reported in, in nature too. So how, how would this look like? I would just highlight in, in this movie uh, two observations. The first panel here is measuring how fast the two surfaces of the fault are actually moving relative to one another, and you will see that's an inhomogeneous motion. And then in the lower panel, we are seeing equivalent plastic strain in the strip that is just adjacent to the fault surface, not on the fault surface, but in the bulk just adjacent to the fault surface. And if I click on this movie, you would see first that what happens is that the fault is slipping at a rate of one nanometer per second, very small. And then the creep from the ace, from the velocity strengthening penetrates into the velocity weakening and the fault accelerates in terms of the slip rate and you start seeing these creeping fronts that are 
uh, penetrating through the velocity weakening region. And eventually, at some point, you start seeing plastic stain popping up, although the, the slip rate on the fault is just still a few nanometers per second. But because of the sharpening of the creep front, this constitutes something similar to a quasi uh, singular crack, static crack, and it generates plastic strain even in during the aseismic period. And eventually, uh, you get the nucleation of the event. You see that the slip rate is accelerating, and now it's at the order of centimeters per second. It could reach meters per second, and then the rupture expands. And as it penetrates into the velocity strengthening on one edge, it gets quenched and arrests. But with the arrest of rupture, you also get accumulation of plastic strain, as you can see here. And then the other end is penetrating through the other velocity strengthening, it eventually gets arrested. And again, with the arrest of the crack, you get accumulation of the plastic strain. And as the rupture, as the slip rate decreases throughout, uh, it's now going down from several meters per second to uh, centimeters per second. And eventually it will just become too small so that we can switch back to the quasi dynamic uh, regime. And eventually you get back to the same uh, earthquake cycle. So now the slip rate becomes microns per second. And potentially it goes down very low to nanometers per second, and another event would would occur. So here is another event again creeping, and this this is this is how these subsequent earthquake ruptures are generated. And as they are generated, you start also seeing plastic strain changing in the bulk. And the plastic strain accumulates actually again during both seismic and aseismic uh, periods. So here's a plot. The red lines represent plastic strain accumulation during the seismic period. The blue lines represent plastic strain during the aseismic period. I will skip that, but this observation mainly shows how things are changes with the viscosity. As the viscosity increases, the magnitude and extent of off-fault plastic strain decreases. But then here is the thing that actually surprised us and, and we thought it's quite interesting. What happens if we go to smaller and smaller viscosities, which we think is more relevant to the upper crust? So approaching the rate independent plastic limit, but without actually having rate independent, you still have some viscosity. And what we observe is that our cycle simulation becomes increasingly complex. Remember, earthquakes in nature occur in different sizes. You have magnitudes from minus three to magnitude nine, right? So there's a, there's this Gothenburg-Richter scaling and, and, and a range of earthquake magnitude that we can observe. And it's still at a, a mystery. What generates this wide range of earthquake magnitudes and what makes earthquakes stop if they start on a certain fault? I'm not claiming we are finding the answer for this mystery, but one possible contribution is this dynamic segmentation through the interaction with the bulk. You, you would see here that the magenta lines are very much heterogeneous and irregular compared to the case with a higher, with a higher viscosity. And in fact, if we Look, for example, if you imagine you are recording earthquakes over years, you can keep count of earthquakes when they happen. So here is one way to do this, to report a maximum slip rate as a function of time. And each time you get this big spike, this represents a seismic event. So, for example, you, re you report earthquakes over years. You see that, okay, I have a first seismic event. After four years, I have another one. A couple of years, I have a third one. Uh, four more years, I have another one, and so on. So you get some irregularity in the inter-event time. But more interesting, if I look at what appears as one of these seismic events and zoom in, I find that there's actually more complexity in this. This single event does not happen as one earthquake, which is over. It actually happens over days, which and constitute multiple 
sub events. So there are events that happen and, and, and satisfy the definition of a dynamic event. And then things become quiet, but after a few days, another earthquake happens. So you get what's similar to having four shocks and aftershocks in this model modulated by the viscoplasticity in, in the bulk. And even if we zoom even further on, on one of these sub events, we find that there are hours separating these events. And then we zoom even further, we can find we get some shocks uh, separated by a few minutes and even by uh, a sub sub minute and this kind of of temporal clustering is observed in nature and we think that the nonlinear rheology in the bulk is contributing to the organization of these events so it's it's kind of a russian doll uh, temporal clustering we are seeing here but not only this something that is quite interesting too is is what we observe in terms of the plastic strain and how the plastic strain is accumulating in the bulk. And so not only that the slip is evolving on the fault surface, but the inelastic strain and the damage is also accumulating in the bulk and it's an accumulating in a spatially non-uniform non way. And we can track it every um, from one event to another and it's also showing this non-uniformity. So you look at the fault, you start with a simple surface, but after a few cycles, you start seeing that you have generated these fault zones uh, as a function of, of the slip. And, and an observation that we also see that the equivalent plastic strain decreases with distance from the fault, and this power law decay is also observed in terms of the intensity of the fractures. Uh, the other thing that comes into observation here is if we plot the range or the length of the events, we find that it also has some sort of hierarchical seismicity in space. So not all events are of the same magnitude. Some events are partial rupture, some events are small, and some events are actually fault spanning. More, more, uh, moreover, uh, if I look at this, so let me just um, uh, get here this final uh, slide that shows why we think this kind of an of of self organization by plastic strain is happening. What we think is happening is that as the rupture generates plasticity ahead of the rupture tip, it eventually actually ends the rupture tip. So plasticity is a dissipative mechanism. It in in increases the effective toughness and eventually it makes the rupture self-arrest. So here is a video again for the slip rate on the, on the top, but on the bottom, instead you have the different stress components. What is important to us here is that the green line represents the one stress component that balances with friction and the blue line is the fault strength as measured by the friction. And you would see that initially, once the stresses reaches the yield strength, you will start generating plasticity because that's the yield surface. So as the rupture propagates and expands, eventually the stresses reaches the uh, yield surface. It generates plasticity as I showed before, but eventually something quite interesting happens. You start seeing these stress plateaus that are formed ahead of the rupture tip, and these stress plateaus are signatures for the saturations at the yield surface, at the yield stress. So you have a plastic region ahead of the rupture tip that acts as an energy sink, and potentially, if you look at the, the rupture front at the top, potentially gets arrested as this plastic zone is expanded. And another interesting thing happened is that it cannot penetrate through, but then it jumps and you create a new rupture ahead of the plastic zone. And this segmentation was also observed in simulations of phase field with off, with off crack uh, plasticity in other applications. So let me just conclude here that models with high resolution fault zone physics produce increasingly realistic features and pave the way for next generation 
physics-based seismic hazard analysis. And, 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 and the two examples I showed today, one is with brittle fracture and the other one with off-fault viscoplasticity, uh, suggests that these could generate high-frequency radiation, change the energy balance, produce spatiotemporal uh, clustering, and some of these implications are not relevant only for natural earthquakes, but also for induced uh, seismicity, because what I have shown here was not really tied to a specific fault dimension. So I will stop here. Thank you very much for listening, and I would be happy to take any questions. I think it was a fascinating talk. And we Thank have actually lots of questions. And uh, so let me start with uh, Professor Simanchal Padi. And Professor Simanchal Padi is, uh, has a yep. yep. questions related to uh, how to param parameterize the small branches stochastically, he mean, to account for small scale heterogeneities. Yes, this is, this is an excellent question. So actually structured geologists would go into the field and map these fractures and they quantify it with different parameters, including the length of the fracture, the orientation, and the number of cracks per unit area. So they can also measure the density of damage and how it varies as a function from the fault, from the fault surface. So uh, you could start generating, and I haven't shown this here, but some of the observations are shared are still robust instead of having kind of a periodic arrangement of, of echelon of fractures, which I also observe it, you could start generating random realizations of these, oh. of these fractures and change their length and orientation as well as density as you go away from, from the fault surface. But this is something that uh, structured geologists would measure from uh, fault crops and going out in the field and indirectly through seismic tomography too, because we could obtain some measure of damage through the reduction in the elastic moduli. And we can uh, correlate the reduction in the elastic modulus to the density of the cracks. And, and so that's another indirect observation in addition to going to the field and quantifying these geometric properties. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yes. now I got Yeah, yeah, I would got you like to? Yeah, I'm happy okay. with that. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, now I go to uh, Kadek uh, Palgunadi's question, I guess. Uh, so, Kadek, would you like to interact with uh, Professor Elbenna directly? Uh, yes, if it is possible. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can you go hear ahead. me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you, uh, Professor. It was a very nice talk. I just uh, curious about uh, what is the difference if we if we have the rough fault now in comparison to the fist bone. What would be what we can expect uh, more in the rough fault, or what uh, we cannot expect from the rough fault that can uh, appears in the simulation of the fist bone? Thank you. Uh, okay, this is this is a great question. In in fact. Some of the observations I show in the fishbone yeah. are also observed in simulations of rough faults with different wavelength of, of roughness. So I wouldn't say they are uh, completely different in, in the sense that each one of them is a realization of deviation from the idealized planar fault. And both of them actually exist in the sense that you could have rough faults at different scales and you could also have branches existing with the rough fault so and even the 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 branches uh, I, I didn't show this but it's in the paper uh, eventually uh, evolves a rough profile in the main surface because you can imagine when you slip on these uh, branches each branch acts as a um, a force couple on on uh, a force a force dipole acting on the main surface, and it would produce a little fluctuations in the geometry of the main surface. So there are similarities between um, rough faults and and branches. The the main difference could be in the discreteness 
of the branches compared to the continuum nature of, of, of the rough fault, at least the way we are currently adopted in, in, in the simulation, we assume some function, we truncate to a certain wavelength, the, 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 the branches allows you to add some discrete feature that may or may not exist and play with the length of the geometric features that are also observed in, in fault zone. So fault zone can, includes both, uh, but so similar uh, uh, similar uh, implications in terms of uh, of stress heterogeneity, uh, enhanced high frequency generation, flat uh, acceleration spectrum in the near field are also observed in both cases. Okay, thank you very much, thank Professor. You. Thank you. Uh, so another question from Love. Uh, Love, would you like to interact with the uh, our? The speaker directly? Yes, sir. sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Albana, for your talk. Uh, I had a very similar question uh, about fault roughness and uh, the fishbone. Uh, like, are you modeling both of them together into the same simulation? And if yes, how are they interacting with each other? Yes, we are modeling them all in the same simulation. So what, how, how we model them is that we, we have the fault surface, which represents a surface discontinuity, the main fault. And then we have these, this group of branches that are offset from the main fault with a short distance. So currently we don't assume that they are uh, directly jointed together, but they are separated with a small distance. And these are also represent uh, surfaces of discontinuity that are governed by similar friction loads, and 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 then everything spontaneously uh, respond to the stress perturbations as the rupture on the main fault propagates. So the wave field, for example, generated by the main fault rupture can load the secondary branches and make them slip, and these branches, this the slip on the secondary branches also feeds back into the main fault. But all of them are solved within the same simulation together. Just uh, one more thing to add, like, uh, so I'm assuming uh, the fault that you're modeling is uh, comprising of similar, like, uh, small point sources in order to discretize the whole fault. So, uh, uh, like, what percentage of the total, let's say, if you're modeling a six magnitude earthquake, so it would correspond to about a 10 to the power 19 Newton meter of seismic moment. So, what percentage of that you are transferring through the fishbone and other parameters oh. like the rise time and all that. Yes, yes. So we, we haven't looked into this in details, but what I can tell you is the slip on each of these secondary branches is really tiny compared to the slip on the main fault. Remember, they are short and the slip accumulated on them is also short. So what we found is that the contributing to the slip budget, that these branches like contribute maybe one to two percent of the total slip on, on on slip budget in the simulation, so uh, they they are really small compared to like the seismic moment accumulated on the la longer fault, which also accumulates larger slip. Thank you, thank you very much. As far as nucleation study is concerned, I shouldn't complicate my model and just consider elastic model and. Somehow tweak A and B's and D sub C's may not be so realistic or uh, of, all, uh, of all the stresses and not bother about off fault plasticity as far as nucleation study is concerned. Am I right on that? So, so this is, this is uh, an excellent uh, observations. The, the, the point is we don't really know where the correct answer is. They are it's very possible to cook up a, a heterogeneous simulation that will lead to similar observations, right? And it's, it's, it's also important to realize that, that whatever frictional parameters we put into the system or roughness, these are also eventually evolving as the slip on the fault increases. So the, the fault geometry itself could change and the frictional properties themselves can change. The point is this is a complementary mechanism. I'm not like, for, for example, I cannot claim that this is actually what is being observed. But for example, when people do experiments on rock and, and measure acoustic emissions, they seem to detect 
some acoustic emissions before the nucleation phase and before the seismic event and take this as a proxy for a precursor of damage accumulation before the nucleation of the seismic event. So indirectly, there's some evidence that even before the nucleation, not only that you get the segmented pulse on, on the fault surface, but there's something happening in the bulk that is that goes beyond elasticity into the inelastic regime or the damage, which could be picked if you have the right, the right sensor. So you may not bother about plasticity and, and there's a lot of uh, like a lot of potential to still explore with elasticity in, indeed. But the question is, you may also like to bother about plasticity because or damage because it's also realistic and may happen. And then uh, eventually we can put these two, two um, effects together and study within this integrated framework of sequence of earthquakes and a seismic slip, which one is more robust and persists over cycles. So, so you see, when when you have just a single event, we can we can similar to the branches, we can do whatever we want. But the 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 real quest is what happens if we let this system evolve over uh, long periods of time and start looking at the robust stochastic features of the system. So. I, I think the elastic simulations are fascinating and, and, and particularly the work that you have done as well as Rob Viasca's work and others in understanding effects of frictional heterogeneities is, is, was really eye-opening and, and contributes to one side of the uh, problem. And then there are other sides that we, we try to look at and hopefully we can converge eventually when we even push this into the case where we let the fault geometry itself evolves, so we can really get the whole cycle between fault geometry, bulk creology, and stress state on 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 the fault zone. Right. I I think I have related questions, but I uh, maybe I, I I ask that as well right now. So. Uh, uh, just a technical, I mean, in the sense that does off fault plasticity makes the velocity weakening region more locked? Oh, that's that's a, a, a great question. And in depending on the parameter regime you are looking, you are operating at, and this is where we need some more measurements and observations to constrain the uh, constitutive relation parameters. Yes, the answer is yes, it can actually make the fault more locked. I haven't shown all results yet, but there are cases when you actually get small repeating earthquake on the velocity weakening patch that are not penetrating the full velocity weakening patch. Again, because of this toughening effect of plasticity, you can get slow slip within the velocity weakening patch. So uh, one message that Take, take home messages when we characterize a region with a velocity weakening or velocity strengthening. Yeah. This actually was mainly done on experiments with elastic uh, material or simulations with elastic material. Once you have a nonlinear rheology, this interplays with the frictional properties and the effective response can be very different from the response that you get in the elastic simulation. Yeah, so I start my simulation. Okay, I'll stop here. I think I started my simulations <laughs> by making the fault more locked and then see if I get the way you saw. But yeah, I'll stop here. But just one more. You know, but, I... but this is this is very good because this is another thing that evolves naturally as part of, of the simulations we are seeing. Initially, the fault is is velocity weakening per definition, right? But because yeah. of the uh, co-seismic and aseismic generation, the plastic strain that feeds back into the stress heterogeneity and, yeah. and it changes the effective response of the fault. Some In some limits, it could be, and in fact, there is a very interesting question that one can post about, uh, and the answer probably would be different for quasi-dynamic versus dynamic, but the question is, can we homogenize these complexities into some effective properties on a planar fault so that we can we can get similar answer this is a problem in homogenization it just happens to be 
it's a little bit challenging in our applications where we have inertia and we have nonlinear uh, and non-smooth properties, but it's 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 possible and it's a it's a holy grail and a quest. So so if you are interested, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> No, I'll stop here. And yeah, so we have a couple of raised hands if you don't mind. So okay. uh, let me see. Varun, would you like to? Uh... Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Albana. That was a very interesting talk. But I do feel uh, a little, I mean, significantly out of depth. Uh, I am into uh, simulating ground motions, but uh, I have been using very simplistic models like kinematic uh, you know, dislocation models in which you directly prescribe uh, discontinuity to your, uh, you know, uh, differential uh, fault movement. So, in the context of engineering, uh, I wanted to know that how far from your fault uh, one has to be for, uh, or rather within the fault zone, how far in terms of like kilometers mm -hmm. for uh, all these uh, complexities that you talked about, the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, faulting of the secondary branches and so on. So th those effects to be observed on the uh, ground motion that of yes. engineering significance. Yeah, this is this is a very this is a fascinating question and a very timely topic. And I would actually even encourage you to follow up on what Kick is the Southern California Earthquake Center and people like Christine Golay and Steve Day are are trying to do in terms of physics-based ground motion simulations. What I can tell you is there are definitely effects that can decay away from the uh, rupture from the fault zone and may not affect far field observations. But the, the, the more interesting effect that happens due to this fault zone complexity is that the rupture itself that you are getting on the main fault is affected. So in your kinematic model, you have to assume some rise function, uh, rise time function, and, and you have to vary this heterogene heterogeneously on, on the fault in order to generate enough radiation and, 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 mod and modulate the frequency content and so on. The, the point is, if we want to start from a physics-based initial point, then we know that these complexities, even if there's some direct effects, can be can decay quickly from the fault surface, but the lasting influence is on the uh, parametrization of the main rupture itself. So things like these kinds of wiggles that you see on the slip surface, this enriches the high frequency generation. If you take the slip profile uh, from my simulation and you put it into a kinematic model, it would be on a planar surface. It would be very different from what you will get from, say, a semi-elliptic kind of, of slip profile corresponding to a uniform uh, stress drop. So there are, I would say, there are effects that are robust and, and that is encoded in the slip function as well as the rise time function on the main rupture, but and, and things like high frequency that is being convected to larger distances, but then there are some effects that can decay pretty quickly from, from the rupture surface. For example, changes in the normal stress can decay. These spikes in the stress decays are pretty localized and decays pretty quickly. So uh, I would say that the main message here is that we need the physics in order to inform what type of slip functions, say beyond cost of uh, idealized rise time function, et cetera, are relevant to our, to our observations. Right, right. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Professor uh, Elvina. Uh, I think we have made you really tired, so I'm not taking all the questions now. So, uh, I, I would be happy to answer them. If, if, if there are more questions, I would be very happy to answer them by email and, 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 and I, I'm really honored by this opportunity and I'm very much enjoying this discussion and all the questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so should I? Okay, Professor Shikande, would you? I think you are on mute. Uh, 
does it help? Can you, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor Elvana, I would, of course, uh, write a couple of questions, queries uh, via email, but uh, just a quick query. Uh, this has been bothering me for uh, some time now, and I have not um, uh, found any uh, rational explanation or anything uh, that seems uh, reasonable, at least to me. Uh, 2015 Gorkha earthquake in Nepal, uh, they, uh, there were two events, one in April and one in May, uh, yes. within a span of 20 uh, odd days. And it was the same fault which ruptured, I mean, uh, over a period of time. But the ground motion characteristics that were recorded at Kathmandu, they were extremely different, very different. Actually, the first event, and although the uh, magnitude size of event was same, almost same, in the both the uh, major events, the ground motion recorded, uh, uh, I mean, was ex very, very, uh, I would say, uh, surprisingly, very uh, high amount of frequency, high amount of energy in uh, around period uh, four seconds. I mean, that's something that we don't observe uh, in, uh, I have, at least I have not seen any record of that kind. But yes. uh, uh, the same uh, fault ruptured a couple of days later, I mean, uh, in May and uh, that event, uh, that that time series looks uh, almost like any other uh, earthquake uh, time history that you would expect. So, what? I mean, obviously there is something very strange happening there. So, do you have any explanation for that? This is an excellent question, and I hope, I wish I I could I could answer it, but I don't have enough information to to answer this particular question. Of course, the Long period uh, motion in Kathmandu was intriguing and was usually was attributed, at least the dominant explanation for that was, of course, the basin, basin effect and, in, and amplification and wave filtering in the Kathmandu basin. But, but you, the, the more, the more and, and I agree with you that this is unusual to have an amplification at, at this long period, and, and this is even scary for buildings that are in on Los Angeles, for example, where they expect to have events uh, of a similar or larger magnitude, and it's in a basin in, 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 in this area, and, and it's expected to be amplified by the basin effect, and most of the high-rise buildings would have frequencies in that range. So this is or, or base isolated buildings would have free, uh, period, natural period in that range. So this is really scary from that perspective. Um, I don't know why the second event didn't introduce a similar effect, but it's not only a question of magnitude because there are, comp there are contributions related say to directivity, for example, and if the directivity of the events is not, is not the same, then probably the focusing effect within the basin versus away from the basin would be different. But I wish I have a quantitative answer to your fascinating question, but I, I don't, I'm sorry. So this is definitely something that is of interest to, to earthquake physicists. And I hope that through these simulations where uh, we observe events that are generated naturally, and, and some of them can propagate in a certain direction, some other direction, some can be modulated by strong plasticity and damage effect, and some could uh, break through and generate stronger ground motion. We could generate patterns similar to what, what you are uh, highlighting here. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Elvina. I think it was really inspiring to me and students and students like me <laughs> as well. So okay. yeah, uh, I I really wish this could happen in person, but uh, I now request uh, Professor Pankaj Agarwal to kindly conclude the session and uh, it, uh, and please go ahead, sir. <coughs> so <clears throat> on behalf of the department, I once again thank Professor Urbana. It was a great talk. I really wish we could do this lecture in person. However, I take the opportunity to invite you to the department's upcoming 
symposium, that is seven symposium on earthquake engineering, scheduled in November 2022. We will send the formal invitation to you soon. We will be happy to meet you in person, learning more about earthquake and fracture. I thank you and your our participants from all corners of India and world for making this lecture a grand success. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, I'm really honored by the invitation and, and thank you. I, I enjoyed the discussion and the questions and I really felt as uh, if I were at home. So thanks to, so much and I look forward to our future interactions. And thanks again, Sohum, for the very kind invitation. Yeah.